Sabbath Church. I hope you had a good morning with your family or your spouse. And if you didn't have anyone in your house to pray together, to sing, and to study the Bible, I hope you had a bit of time to call someone and do that over the phone. Well, if you didn't have time for that in the morning or you forgot to do it, I want to encourage you that once you finish the service today, that you may give someone a call, um, one of our church members, one of your family members, and share with them something that you learned from the service. And ask them what have they learned from the service as well. If they didn't watch our service, I want to encourage you that you send a copy to them and encourage them to watch and spend some time studying the Word of God today. Brothers and sisters, this is certainly not the ideal and not how we would like to do church for a long time. We want to encourage you to pray with your family before our service begins and after we finish the service that God may hold this time of trouble for longer and give us time to come back to church, to worship together, to sing, praise God, and to learn more how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Not only do we want to follow Jesus, but we want to learn from Jesus how to be a disciple maker. So today we have a special guest sharing the message with us. His name is Jared. Uh, in a minute, you're going to be hearing from Jared. He's going to share some of his personal experience, how he came to have a personal relationship with Jesus and how Jesus has changed his life. I'm pretty confident that you enjoy his message today. Before we get to his message, I'd like to um, share with you one or two passages from the scripture. As you know, here in Austinville and Ballina Church, by the way, I'm welcoming Austinvillians and Ballinans into our service today. We are learning about discipleship and we have defined what a disciple is. If you remember well, a disciple has three elements in its definition. Number one is someone who followed Jesus. Number two is someone who is being transformed by Jesus. And number three is someone who is committed to the mission of Jesus Christ. And the mission of Jesus is to seek and save the lost. And that is what, why we learn in this quarter about discipleship. Our mission is to seek and save the lost. So remember, you are a disciple of Jesus, so am I. And here together, we come as a church to learn how to make more disciples. Today, we are learning about the importance of the scripture in the disciples' life. The scripture is extremely important. The Bible and the study of it is very essential to the growth uh, and the spiritual development of Jesus' disciple. Perhaps that's how transformation will happen. That's, where, uh, that's when you contemplate the life of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and His promises that He has given to all of us. Let me read you two passages before we get um, into your service. One of them is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, and it says this, He might, who is Jesus, sanctify and cleanse her, the church, His disciples, with the washing of water by the Word. In other words, it is this word here, the Bible, who cleans us from our unrighteousness and from our sins. And I'm sure, as I have, you probably have sinned against God throughout the week. And that's why Sabbath becomes so important. It's a day that we come to Jesus and Jesus gives us forgiveness. And now I also want to read to you another very important aspect and why the disciples should be studying the Bible. The other one is that as we contemplate the promises and we read and learn about the promises of the Bible, which is what Peter says. He says that through these promises that we have in the Bible, we become partakers of the divine nature of Jesus Christ, having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust. What a beautiful promise that God who cleans us through his word and he makes us nat our nature to be transformed and changed to be a divine nature, just like Jesus. That's my desire for you today. May God bless you. And as Jerry begins the service, he will pray before his message. I hope you have a lovely day. May God bless you. 
Good morning, Austinville Church. I am sad that I can't be with you in person today, but I'm excited to be able to share this message and part of my testimony with you guys today. Um, a little bit about myself. I am from the United States, and I actually came here last year for a rise, but I ended up staying on to Bible work. And currently, I've been Bible working in Mwalumba, and it's been really good. Yeah, so today I will be sharing the message, Why Study the Bible? But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, I pray that you be with me as I share this message. Even if it's not in person, I pray that you'd help me um, in my words to be able to really give the message you want me to give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There have been two times in my life where I thought I was going to die. Or, okay, let me clarify. There have been two times in my life where I was struck with the realization that my life could end in the next minute. Um, I'll tell you the first story now and then the second story at the end. So the first time was in January of 2019. I was driving back to my uni when I got in a pretty bad car accident. Um, I was driving down the highway and the semi truck was on my side and I was just about to pass it, but as I was passing it, it merged into my lane and clipped the back of my car and my car just started spiraling out of control. And it was spinning, I couldn't see anything, I was gripping the steering wheel and the only thing I could pray was, God please, God please, God please, God please. Because the question was going through my mind, Jared, are you ready to die? And spoiler, I didn't die, which is why I'm here talking with you guys today. Um, but I was hit with the realization, the terrible realization, that even though I was doing great in school, I had a great social life, I was involved with campus ministries and church and having you know, an hour-long devotional every morning, I didn't know if I was saved. Essentially, my car spun out, hit the middle divider, spun back out, and then got hit by another car. But luckily, everybody got out unharmed, and I didn't have any whiplash or any injuries. It was definitely a miracle. You know, it's funny, it's easy to spend a lot of time doing stuff with, while we miss the whole point of why we're doing it. Um, the only thing that mattered in the moment I thought I was going to die was whether or not I was right with God. But despite all the things I did for God, I wasn't sure where I stood. Um, at this point in my spiritual walk, I had definitely a pretty legalistic mindset, which is actually something I'll be talking about later on. But it made me think, you know, where had I gone wrong? Um, why exactly was I reading the Bible? And what if I'd been approaching this the wrong way the whole time? So today, I want to talk about why study the Bible. And now, this is a pretty, pretty big question, and there's a lot of reasons, but I figured... I'm probably going to start from the outside and then go into Scripture. So outside of Scripture, there's a lot of compelling reasons why we should study the Bible. Um, for example, there aren't many books that claim to be divinely inspired. The thing that differentiates the Bible from, say, a novel or a kid's book is that those types of books don't claim to be divinely inspired, but the Bible does. 2 Timothy 3.16 And this Bible passage makes a really big claim. It says... All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, the Greek word here is that it's breathed out by God. And it claims that all scripture is given from God. And just because the Bible makes this claim, though, it doesn't mean that it's true. You know, ordinary claims only recall ordinary evidence, but extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I wouldn't have to prove to you that I went to Kohl's the other day for my groceries. I would have to prove it to you if I told you I had dinner with the um, premier. So, what supports the Bible's claims? There are a lot of things that do support the Bible's claims, like history and archaeology, especially prophecy. And prophecy is actually something that I'm really passionate about, but I actually am not going to be talking about it much for here. Um, John 14, 29, Jesus is talking with his disciples, and he basically tells them, he tells them a lot of things that are going to happen so that when they do happen, they would be able to believe. Now, God doesn't force us to, under, or to believe him without first giving us sufficient evidence. And the Bible contains dozens, actually hundreds of prophecies in which God has accurately predicted the future. But another reason to study the Bible is consistency. And I'm going to be talking about four types of consistency very briefly. The first one is cultural consistency. The Bible is transculturally po um, popular in a way that no other book is. Um, usually literature or works of fiction or s from a specific culture usually stay within that culture. But for some reason, the Bible, which is a book written by a small group of insignificant nomads, has gone beyond culture into 
places all around the world. And it's because it answers important questions like origin, like where are we from, or meaning, why are we here, and what is our purpose, or morality, how do we live, and destiny, so where are we going. And the Bible has answers to these questions that people have found to be very satisfactory. Um, another thing is internal consistency. The Bible is an amazing book. It was written over a period of about 1,500 years. It has about 60, it has 66 books, letters, and histories, about 40 authors. And it was written over three continents. And yet, throughout all of this, it only has one story. And it's crazy the unity that the Bible has, despite these authors being separated by time and distance. Like They didn't have cars or cell phones to be able to go and talk with each other. Um, and yet, the same Holy Spirit is the one that has inspired every single book. And that's evident through its consistency. Another reason why is translational consistency. In 1947, they discovered what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were essentially a library of scrolls from a community of Jews who lived 150 to 50 years before the time of Jesus. And these were preserved mostly due to the dry climate and then also the clay jar absorbing the moisture. But they discovered these, and it has passages from every Old Testament book except for Esther. And compared to our modern-day biblical manuscripts, they're effectively identical to our modern day text. Now, when it comes to the New Testament, there is more manuscriptual evidence for Jesus than for Shakespeare, which is pretty crazy. You know, there are more than 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament found today, and the latency period, or the time from the event to when these, these things were written, was basically non-existent. Um, Jesus died in AD 31, and the Gospel of Mark was probably written in AD 55. Um, when you lay out these Greek manuscripts all next to each other, they have an agreement of about 97%, and when you take away terms of embellishment, it's 100%. The last type of consistency is experiential consistency. This is probably one of the biggest ones. You know, millions and millions of people from different backgrounds, different generations, different times, different places, they've had an experience with the Bible that has changed their life. And my life has been changed because of this book, and I'm actually here talking about this because of this book. Now, I could give you a lot of reasons why you should study the Bible, but I think it might be easier if I share my personal testimony with you. I was born in Loma Linda, California, which is essentially the Kurenbong of North America, just much bigger. Um, I was very privileged to grow up in a great home with two loving parents. I was, you know, we had a great church community, and my mom homeschooled us until year seven, and we're always involved with things in our community, like Pathfinders or other church events. Like, I was very, very blessed um, growing up. In high school, I got pretty busy with tennis, swimming, cello, piano, clubs, and academics, and so I never really made my spiritual life a priority. You know, I was always surrounded by spiritual stuff, but it never really bothered to make it my own. Um, fast forward to year 11 in high school, I went canvassing for the first time. And that's basically where you go door to door for an entire summer selling Adventist books. And this was probably one of the first times where my faith really got challenged. I um, you know, people at the doors would come out and they'd be like, you know, you Adventists are a cult, or, you know, you're a heretic, and I'm going to call the police on you. And then they would call the police on you, and it was kind of stressful. Um, but it's, beside all of that, it was actually a really positive experience because it really made me dig in and question, what do I believe in? Why do I believe it? And actually, that experience made me go and do canvassing another summer because it was such a faith-building experience. When I got to uni, I went to Southern Adventist University, and I got involved in as many things as possible, like academics, clubs, sports, church leadership, all these things, like you name it. I just wanted to be like experiencing as much as I could. And also, I wanted to grow spiritually. So the year, um, beginning of my second year at uni, I was involved in a lot. I was treasurer for our church. I was a Sabbath school teacher. I worked on the campus ministries team as a small group coach. And I was doing all these things, but something just felt wrong. Because even though I was involved in so many spiritual things, it felt like God was really distant. I had this idea that when I started campus ministries that I was going to get from point A to point B in my spiritual walk, and it was going to be like this set amount of growth. But actually, at the end of the semester, I found that I had actually regressed spiritually. And, you know, all the spiritual leadership positions I had had left me feeling more discouraged, and I just felt spiritually empty. So I decided to take some time off of campus ministries. When I look back at it now, it's quite obvious what my problem was. 
Um, that whole semester, I tried to have been doing spiritual work without really knowing God. I had substituted my spiritual jobs for an actual relationship with God. And, you know, I had this idea that if I was just around God enough, if I just talked about God enough, if I just thought about God enough, He'd become real in my life. And in the end, it just left me feeling really empty because having a spiritual job doesn't make you a spiritual person. And then the second term rolled around. And before I went back to uni, I went to stay with my grandpa in Atlanta, which is about an hour and a half um, away from the uni. Now, my grandpa Chung, he's a hardcore pastor. But not only that, he's a hardcore Korean pastor. And so, you know, in the morning, you'd be sleeping, and then he'd come up, and he'd, like, open up all the windows, and all this cold wind is blowing into the room. You're like, Grandpa, what are you doing? And it's winter, and he's like, get up. And he's like, it's 5 a.m. But he'd still make us get up and drink water and activated charcoal, and he's, uh, he's very intense. And before I left to go back to uni, he asked me this question, and he asked me this every year. He was like, Jared, you read Bible and Spirit of Prophecy every day, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, of course I do, Grandpa. And he's like, okay, good. And then I thought to myself, you know, do, have I ever really read the Bible or Spirit of Prophecy? Like, really read it for myself. And then my grandpa told me a story that caught my interest. So he told me that my Uncle John, before he went to medical, or when he went to medical school, he decided to dedicate an hour every day to prayer and Bible study. And then after that, my uncle was able to memorize things more easily, and he was top of his class in medical school, and he just did really well. And I thought, you know what? I could use a little bit of help with school next semester. Because that semester, I was going to be taking three lab sciences on top of all my other classes. I was going to be taking physics, organic chemistry, and quantitative analysis. Like That's quite a lot of classes. And I thought, you know what? If my Uncle John did it, then maybe I could do it. Because at this point, Even though I grew up Christian, I never really made reading the Bible a priority. Like, aside from topical Bible studies to get baptized, I didn't really have a strong devotional life. And so I decided, maybe for selfish reasons, that I was going to do one-hour devotionals every day. And a lot of things happened, and so I need to summarize them very quickly. But here's essentially what happened. First of all, rebuke. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, I thought that I, I used to think that, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person, like, I'm, I'm somebody, like, I do, look at all these things I do for God, and, but as I was reading, <laughs> as I started reading through the Bible, God started revealing just how much my righteousness was like filthy rags, you know, through the stories I was reading, I began to notice my character flaws very clearly, I'd be reading stories about these Bible characters, and then I'd see the struggles that they're having are the ones that I also have. And they would just reflect my shortcomings. And it's, it can be quite painful to realize that you're not a great person. But luckily, God is good because the second thing he did was, the second way he began to work in my life was through guidance. So even though God shows you the true condition of, his, of your heart, he loves you too much to leave you that way. And even though it's discouraging to see all my character flaws brought to light, God began to show me that there is a way for me to overcome these things, and that's through Him. I can't make myself a better person. God, only God could change my character. The third way God started working was through peace. Now, this is, I think, one of the craziest things for me. Even though this was my busiest semester yet, I think I was taking around seven or eight classes, in addition to my three, or including my three difficult sciences. That semester, I had no stress from school. I didn't feel the same anxiety and stress and pressure that I felt every semester before. And the crazy thing is, I actually felt like I had more time in my schedule. Like, I had thought that I'd have to give up something if I'm going to do these one-hour devotionals. But I actually had more time in my day. And the thing is, the thing I realized was, most of the time, when you give something to God, He gives it back to you in abundance. Now, my journey wasn't always just mountaintop experiences. Our spiritual walks seem to be like waves, like there's highs and there's lows, and that was definitely my experience. But the cool thing is that in every valley, God allows us to learn lessons that actually bring us closer to Him. So growing up as a firstborn in a Korean family, I grew up with a very achievement-oriented mindset. And this kind of spilled into every aspect of my life. Whether it be academics or sports or extracurriculars or even my spiritual life, my goal was to achieve. And slowly over time, this began spilling into my devotionals. 
I began to make the mistake of viewing my good devotionals as a thing that made me right with God. And if I didn't have a good enough devotional session, then I wouldn't feel like I was right with God. And over that next year, I kept on doing one-hour devotionals. And the thing is, it just felt like my walk with God just kept on getting tougher and tougher. Um, even though I was doing everything right and reading the Bible for an hour every day and actually praying for 30 minutes. And if anything, it felt like my sins were just getting worse. I was still struggling with the same things that I'd struggled with before, like jealousy, pride, and lust. And it just seemed that my devotionals didn't get rid of them. If anything, it actually felt like sometimes it made it worse. And as I was trying, you know, I was trying harder and harder, and it felt like God was getting farther away from me. And even though I was doing all these spiritual things with leadership, church, devotionals, and prayer, I still didn't feel connected with God. And that's when the car accident happened. After the car accident, I started thinking about why I was doing things. You know, we, you can study the right book for the wrong reasons. And that's what I did. Um, sometimes we read the Bible because we're motivated by guilt. You know, we know it's the right thing to do, and so we just add it to the list of the other things we think we need to do, like being involved with church or tithing. And it's just a sense of obligation rather than a desire and a want to do these things. Uh, maybe it's our pride. You know, we want people to know that we have a good relationship with God, and there's a certain status that comes with knowing your Bible. Or maybe, like me, it's because we view our relationship with God as transactional. Like, if I do this for God, then God has to do this for me. You know, we can definitely do the right thing for the wrong reasons. But the beautiful thing is that God is actually able to use our corrupt motivations for our own good. And even though I hadn't necessarily started reading the Bible for the right reasons, God was still working in my life. You know, I think we all start off with a warped picture with God, but it's through his word that God begins to change that picture. And through the Bible, he began to show me the part of the picture that I was missing. Um, John 5.39 says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. So, just like the Pharisees, I believe that the act of reading the Bible held salvational merit, like, in and of itself. I thought the act of reading the Bible was a thing that was saving me. And it was kind of in the back of my head, but it was still there. Um, the thing is, the act of reading the Bible itself doesn't save you. Jesus told the Jews that the, scripture, uh, that the scriptures testify of him. You know, I had this idea in the back of my mind that Jesus was the first step in my Christian walk, and then, you know, you move on to tougher stuff like prophecy or doctrines and all that different stuff. But actually, that's completely wrong. Jesus isn't just the first step in the staircase. He's the whole staircase. And the thing that I'd forgotten in that car accident was that the Bible isn't about what I do for God. It's about what Jesus has done for me. And I had missed the gospel. You see, the Bible is not a self-help book. The Bible is actually kind of the opposite of that. It's a book that tells you you can't help yourself. And it's only when we realize we can't save ourselves that our eyes are open for a need of the Savior. The Bible is a story about a God who loves us so much that he would rather die than live without us. And it shows us that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. So, over the next year, the end of 2019 into 2020, I finished uni and decided that before I went off to medical school, I was going to take a year off to let God use me however he wanted. And because of this decision, the Bible has come to life in a way that I had never experienced before. Despite the global pandemic, 2020 and 2021 have actually been the best years of my life. I decided to come to Australia to do Arise, which was a life-changing experience. Um, Arise helped me to dive deeper into God's Word and really helped me to see aspects of the Bible that I had missed. You know, I discovered a picture of God's love that was just so amazing. It made me want to jump with joy because God is just so good. And I gained an understanding of the gospel that was so much clearer than my works-based mindset. And a key lesson that I learned in my relationship with God is that it's not dependent on the things I do, but rather what Jesus has done for us. Unfortunately, Arise ended early because of COVID, but after a lot of prayer and a lot of tears, I decided to step out in faith and continue here in Australia um, because I felt like God was calling me to stay here. So I moved down south to Newcastle for two months and with seven other people from my Arise cohort. And it was one of the toughest decisions I've ever had to make. You know, I had family telling me to come home, airlines were shutting down, there's an imminent lockdown, and I didn't have any guarantees for the future. 
But this experience taught me to trust in God more than I've ever had to before. And it also taught me to claim Bible promises. Um, because I didn't have anything else to hold on to, I had to hold on to God's word. And this taught me an important principle. Um, in 2 Peter 2, 3-4, to I'm going to read the NIV. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. This verse is essentially saying that we're able to participate in the divine nature through claiming God's promises. And I think that's amazing. Like, we are able to experience this fellowship with God through his promises. And a promise that I claim was in Isaiah 42, 16, and it's, I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. God kept his promise. All of last year, I didn't know what the next step was going to be, but at the last moment, God would open the door and show me what the next step was. Now, this is definitely not my preferred method of living. I like planning things out and knowing what comes next. But I've realized that God can plan out my life a lot better than I can. After Newcastle, God led me up to Marulamba to Bible work. And at the time, it just seemed like chance. But looking back now, I could see that this was a divine appointment. Um, God just worked at and orchestrated different things to bring me here. And Bible working has been an incredible experience. It's provided me with opportunities to share my faith, and it's been able to, I've been able to be equipped with tools of sharing my faith and growing in confidence in God's Word. And it's just been so amazing and actually really fun. Um, not only that, but I got to experience the joy of leading other people to God. Um, earlier on this year, as there was another experience that further confirmed this, and Basically, the conference was running this 11-week training program, or discipleship program called Local Missions Training, and they asked me to be the administrator for that. And that was so much fun, and there's so many miracles that happened in that program. Um, for example, usually it takes a lot of time to plan these programs, but in one and a half weeks, we had an entire 11-week program sorted and had people rostered on for the topics. And at the end of the program, five out of 12 of our students decided to get baptized, which was so awesome. You know, now I'm back to Bible working, and I've been learning so many lessons, um, just giving studies and being able to talk about God's Word. And something that I've really seen is that God has a plan for our lives. Um, currently, I am planning on going back home in December, and uh, we'll close the chapter of Bible working here. But I've learned from the Bible that, you know, the Bible teaches us how we can live godly, joy-filled lives in a world of uncertainty. And it's not through our own strength, but it's through God's strength. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I read that verse at the beginning, but now I want to read it again because it highlights a point. You know, God gave us the Bible so that we could be changed. The Bible isn't just something that we read in the morning and then leave behind for the rest of the day. The Bible is meant to transform our lives. And it happens when we understand that the Bible is talking about a living Savior who wants to be involved with every aspect of our lives. I told you the first time I had a near-death experience, but the second time was actually last year. Um, we were hiking out in Newcastle, and we came out to this beach, and the beach had a freshwater runout. Now, a freshwater runout is essentially a large pool of water fed by a river that sits above the beach. And someone had dug this channel, and all this fresh water was rushing out to the ocean, creating this kind of natural water slide and also a huge riptide. And me and my friends decided to jump in because it looked pretty cool. And we're riding it, and then we hop out the side, ride it, hop out the side. But I actually got pulled out because I was too close to the middle. And this rip was really strong. Like, even though I was only waist deep, it pulled me out, and it actually pulls you under the water. And... I got pulled out, and at first I was panicking a little bit, but then I realized, like, this is a normal rip, and luckily I'm a strong swimmer, so I was able to get out to the back and then swim all the way back in. And later on, we were sitting on the beach, and we heard some shouting and some commotion, and we looked over, and there's this older lady, her son-in-law and her pregnant daughter, who were waist-deep in the water, and they're getting pulled out. Someone yelled, like, someone needs to save them! And I was like, yeah, someone does need to save them. And then we looked around, and nobody was going to save them. And me and, friends, me and my friends had this realization that, oh, we need to save them. 
So we, like, we're running into the water, and I wish I could say, you know, I had heroic thoughts, and I was so brave, but the thing that was going through my mind was, you know, a lot of people die trying to save other people from drowning, and it's very possible that I could drown. But my prayer was that God would help me save at least one person. And so we got into the water, and then got separated, and everybody got pulled under. Um, when I came up, I was next to the older lady, and I swam off towards her. And she was panicking, and she was flailing, but luckily she was floating. And so I swam over to her and started asking her some questions to calm her down. And she put her hand on my shoulder, and we were just able to keep her afloat. Um, now, we just kept on getting farther and farther and farther away from the shore. And it felt like it was even farther than it was last time when I had gotten pulled out. And I knew because I'd gotten pulled out by this rip that I could get back to shore by myself safely. But I realized that if I were to try to save this lady, it's very possible that I could also die. And even though we're in the rip, we kept on drifting further and further. And we got to the back and we kept on drifting further out. And I started praying out loud that God would save us and that he would send angels to protect us. And slowly and surely, we ended up getting closer and closer to the shore. My friend James swam out, and then he helped her, and so it was the two of us bringing her back to the shore. And I don't think I've ever kicked harder in my entire life. Um, we finally got her to the shore, and it was such a relief. My legs actually gave out when I got to the shore. And the police came um, with ambulances and police cars and choppers, and there's an ocean rescue on a jet ski that came, and everything worked out, and I, the other two were also all right. Um, and the whole experience was just so surreal. Like, just couldn't believe that all that had happened within the span of probably just 10 minutes. You know, the funny thing is that throughout this whole experience, even though I was faced with death, I had this calmness that, that just didn't really make sense. Even though I knew in the back of my mind, well, actually in the forefront of my mind, that it's very possible that I could have died, I didn't really think about it. And it's not because I'm a hero or I was really brave, definitely had some unheroic thoughts. It was something else. What was the difference between my first and second near-death experience? What was the thing that changed you from being scared to die in the car accident to having peace when faced with a possibility of drowning? It was Jesus. It was the God that I discovered in the Bible. You see, the Bible, it's not just a book that has answers on why things are the way they are or how we should live our lives. The Bible is a book that tells us about a God who loves us so much that he'd do whatever it takes to save us, even if it meant that he would die for us. And when you come to find that God and when you have a relationship with him, it just brings a peace that really doesn't make sense to the rest of the world. So the question, why read the Bible? I hope my testimony would be able to answer part of that for you. But I can tell you, for me, the Bible is a book that isn't just a set of doctrines or a set of rules. The Bible is a book that the God of the universe uses to communicate with us. And my challenge for you, you know, maybe you're new to all of this and you want to find out more about the Savior. I challenge you to commit to reading your Bible. And if you don't have questions about where to start or what things mean, you can ask your pastor. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while, but you feel like you've been missing something. I challenge you to approach the Bible with humility and ask God to give you new eyes to search his word. You know, God wants to connect with us. And he does that through his word. And my prayer for all of us is that we would be able to see him today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, I just want to thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Um, you've given us such an amazing way of communicating with you, and I pray that you would just speak to us through your word. I pray that every single person who watches this message would be able to gain a better understanding of why you've given us your word, and I pray that you'd fill us all with your Holy Spirit. Um, God, please give us an understanding and help us to see you more clearly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for listening to this testimony, and I pray that we will someday be able to meet in person. All right, see ya. Bye.